Good morning, adventurers. My name is Ben, and welcome to a morning show where I sit around, drink some tea, and talk about D&D. This mug is almost impossible to drink out of, but that's my fault for choosing it. Uh, we don't have a whole lot in the way of actual D&D-specific news today, but we did uh, have word come out, word break. Uh, the news came about that uh, the old CEO of Wizards of the Coast, Brian Goldner, has passed away. Um, obviously, that's very sad. He... Uh, was a huge name at the company for quite a, quite a bit of time, uh, so it's very sad, of course, to hear of his passing. And want to wish uh, his family our you know deepest condolences and uh, keep them in your thoughts uh, as they go through this obviously very difficult time. Moving forward from news, it, I don't really have any news other than that, and it's just kind of sad. Um, Moving forward from news, we have the streams. There are actually a good few of them going on in the upcoming today. Um, first up on twitch.tv slash dnd, uh, we've got the Black Dice Society from 7 to 10 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, that is an ongoing ca campaign that Wizards is sort of sponsoring, hosting, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, on their Twitch channel. Uh, we also have at twitch.tv slash the tabletop tavern underscore their final episode of their season um go check it out go support them uh jenny the dungeon master again good friend of the show good friend of mine uh she's put a lot of work into this and uh has is very very excited to like really bring it home uh so definitely go check them out and support them uh they are at 8 p.m eastern time uh and they run yeah, pretty much right up until about 10 as well uh which means that Regardless of which one of those two you decide you want to go take a look at and watch, uh, you will be able to catch the Critical Role live stream, uh, the next episode of Narrative Telephone that is premiering today at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, so whenever you wrap up with one of those two game streams, you can hop right on over to them and watch that one. I believe it's Amy Carrero uh, leading it because Robbie would have led it last time. So definitely check that out if you are into Critical Role, if you've enjoyed Narrative Telephone. If you don't know what I'm talking about, Narrative Telephone is a fun, funny thing that they started doing during the pandemic. Um, and they are bringing the EXU cast on for bits and pieces of it here. Abria was in the original, or I guess the second season of it, the second run of it, whatever you want to call it. And uh, they've got Amy and Robbie on for this like mini run. I don't know if they're going to extend it past that, but it's a good, fun show. Definitely check it out. Um, and I guess a news slash stream uh, announcement thing is that we are now officially one week away from the launch of Critical Role Campaign 3, which is super cool. Honestly, it's it's really awesome. I'm really excited about it. Uh, I have been a fan of Critical Role since early, in se early on in Season 2, uh, so I'm very excited to get to start with a new set of characters and bring them all the way home through the entire season here. Um... If you don't know details about that and you want to know more about it, they have a they posted their announcement video. There are a ton of summaries of it online. Everybody talked about it for a good several days after they actually announced it. So you are more than welcome to go find somewhere where they talk all about that. It's set in Marquette, uh, which is a continent that they have explored a little bit in the past. Um, but it is it is a less Eurocentric uh, continent, which could be. A really really cool and fun place or place to explore and a cool like cultural study because I know that Matt has done a lot of extensive research and extensive uh, work on making sure that it is a good cultural representation of the less Eurocentric uh, cultures that it is actually based on so I'm excited to see what they get into with that one particularly because of the way that they've decided to structure it where they might be bringing in or not might they probably will be bringing in uh, different guests uh, potentially even different rot rotating guests in the DM's chair um, for like little bits of the arcs and stuff like that, which could be really, really cool, particularly if they are the people who have lived those experiences more than Matt has. Um, but that is everything we have for news and for streams. Next up, we have T&D. Uh, today, I have a Death Star mug that my mom got me. It's almost impossible to drink out of, and the handle is really terrible because it just it, the way you have to grab it is just not the best but she was super happy with it and it was really cute and i like it a lot because of that reason specifically oh man 
Uh, the tea that I have is a, oh boy, uh, lemon, peppermint, and uh, there's one other thing in there. Eucalyptus? No, that doesn't sound right. I don't know. It's a lemony, it's mostly lemon peppermint. Uh, it's really, really good. Uh, I have had this one on the show once before, I'm pretty sure, uh, and have greatly enjoyed it because I, I greatly enjoy all of the teas that I have. That's just kind of why I have them. Um, herbal tea, 212 at, or at 212 for two, or not two, three to six minutes, depending on how strong you want it to end up being. Um, but that is everything I have for TND. Now we are going to get into uh, what we are actually talking about today, it is Thursday, which means that it is Third Party Thursday, which means that I have something very special to show you guys, one of my favorite third party supplements. I'm really, really excited about this one. Mm, I gotta put my mug down to get my, my grabbing fingers on for this one. Uh, honestly, normally I, uh, normally I, like, take a bunch of notes on the stuff that I'm gonna talk about, uh, mark out pages and stuff, but, uh, this... This supplement is short. Uh, it is one of the first third-party supplements I ever got, um, and it is what well, yeah. I got it because it was pretty cheap, uh, and I, I saw it and it, I knew I just had to have it. We are talking today about the Cosmic Dragon Breviary. Um, it is, as you can see, very short. It's a soft cover book. Um, I don't love soft covers all the time, but I do really like this one. Uh, it is by, ooh, there we go, down here, Spectre Creations. Uh, they make a lot of really cool stuff. Uh, you can find them on a lot of different platforms. I think I found this through Instagram originally, um, but they are kind of all over the place. Um, but I really, really enjoy this book. And if you can't tell why, it's because there's a dragon on it. Uh, originally, I was going to talk about this uh when fizz like during i was gonna do like a whole dragon week with fizz bands but uh they delayed that and now it's right at halloween and uh, there's no way i'm gonna move the halloween supplement that i'm gonna be talking about off of halloween week because that's a little bit bigger in my mind uh so instead we're gonna talk about this one today uh which is super super cool so th what is in the cosmic dragon breviary it introduces a new subset of dragons effectively and they are the, the cosmos dragons, right? Uh, you've got your comet dragons, your moon dragons, your nebula dragons, your planetary dragons, and your sun dragons. Uh, in addition to uh, having a wormhole drake, the uh, dimensional dragon, which is effectively the god for the, you know, cosmic dragons, as well as a template for aberrant dragons. So while Fizzbands is going to have you know, the uh, uh, Elder Brain Dragon in it, that is specifically more Elder Brain Mind flare esque This one is talking about the actual, uh, like, aberrant nature, potentially, which is super, super cool. Uh, they've also got some character options in here. They've got a Cosmic Dragonborn subrace, um, in addition to uh, four different subclasses, a background, and a couple of racial feats and stuff like that. The whole book is only 35 pages long. 36 pages long, uh, but it is packed, packed full. Like, we start out, here is here is the cover, here is literally the other side of the cover, has the table of contents on it, and immediately you are in with the first page of the bestiary where you get into the comet dragon uh, on literally page two. Page two gets you the stat block. This is a good representation of how big most of these stat blocks are. They take up minimum one full page for the uh, the ancients, which is phenomenal. Um, we are going to go and take a look at what is my favorite of these guys that they put out here. Uh, if I just could flip on over to it. Come on, come on, come on. Here we go. Um, my favorite in particular, are the planetary dragons, right? Uh, which is kind of lame, because, uh, I mean, this artwork is not lame, obviously, but they are the most normal looking of the dragons in this book, right? Because the other ones, you've got one that is almost literally a constellation. Let's back it up a few little bits here. Here's the nebula dragon. It's just, it's, it's gas and stars. I mean, it's not just gas and stars, but like, the... Not the point. 
Uh, planetary dragons are my favorite ones in this book, and I want to read to you just a couple of their uh, features in this book. Um, <clears throat> they have three different types of breath weapon that they can pick from, right? I'm reading off the ancient stat block, to be clear. Three different types of uh, breath weapon to pick from. Uh, I guess, first off, they're a CR. this ancient dragon is a CR 25 creature. Uh, it's got 507 hit points, 23 armor class, 90 foot fly speed. Uh, obviously, legendary actions, legendary uh, resistances, that sort of thing. Um, and like I said, three different breath weapons. Uh, the first... The, not the first. The reason it has three different uh, breath weapons is because it is tied to a specific feature that it has called Axial Tilt, where they can align themselves to change form. Um, so that's pretty awesome. Okay? So they can change this form, and they gain a different aspect of their breath weapon when they do so, in addition to some other features as well. But the breath weapon is, in my mind, the cooler part of it. So, there are three different breath weapons. When the planetary dragon is in gas giant form, it exhales a noxious liquid gas fluid in a 90-foot line that is 10 feet wide. Uh, each creature in that line must make a DC 25 dexterity saving throw, taking 11d6 acid damage and 11d6 poison damage on a failed tip or half as much on a successful one. Whether the saving throw succeeds or not, each target is also poisoned for one minute. The creature can make a DC 17 constitution saving throw at the start of each of its turns, ending the effect on a success. You are automatically poisoning everything you hit in a 90-foot line directly in front of you. That is phenomenal, okay? The poison condition can be absolutely debilitating to players. Uh, it And weirdly enough, a lot of players don't end up with poison resistance or poison immunity by the time they hit those upper levels. It just sort of stops being something that people really lean into because the higher level monsters a lot of the time have immunity, have that poison immunity that they're looking for, and thus players stop really paying attention to it as much. Um, when they are in ice giant form, uh, they get freezing breath, which is a, uh, again, 90 foot line, 10 foot wide, uh, frigid blast infused with icy shards. They must make a dexter dexterity 25 uh, saving throw, taking 11d6 cold and 11d6 piercing damage on a failed save or half as much as a successful one. If a target's saving throw fails by 5 or more, the creature also becomes petrified and is frozen solid until the end of its next turn. That means that if you roll a 20 or lower on this dexterity saving throw, you're petrified for your next turn. You don't get to act on your next turn, which gives this thing a full nether round against you without you being able to do anything. Yes, it's a line, but that is so good for taking people out of the fight. You do that to your barbarian, who is not proficient in dex... I don't, I'm pretty sure barbarians aren't proficient in dexterity saving throws. I'm going to not say that one. I'm going to call it the wizard instead, because I know that wizards aren't. Um, you're going to do that to your wizard, and they roll up, and they hit... You know, they roll super well. They hit a 17... They're petrified for a full turn, in which that turn, or in that turn, they could be doing things like, I don't know, banishment, plane shift, uh, feeble mind. They could be trying to take this thing down, right? So that is phenomenal. Um, and finally, you have uh, molten breath in your terrestrial form. Uh, Dragon exhales a liquid hot metal in 90 foot line, 10 foot wide. Each creature in that line must make, must make a DC 25 dexterity saving throw. On a failed save, it takes 11d6 bludgeoning and 11d6 fire damage and is coated in a thin layer of molten metal. Until a creature takes an action to scrape or wash off the metal, the target takes 1d10 fire damage at the start of each turn. On a successful, on a successful save, it takes half as so much and isn't coated in metal. You have to... You can, like, stack this fire damage onto a creature right and then it just sits there taking fire damage until it blows effectively an entire round to get this stuff off of it that is that is so good that's so beyond good just continuous stacking damage is so so good whenever you can actually get that in there and it doesn't happen all that much in game because again setting things on fire 
becomes a less relevant trait later in the game for the players because they run into a lot of things that have fire resistance or immunity. So they move away from that damage type. But that is not always necessarily the best way to do it. Um, so those are those are the three breath weapons for a planetary dragon. Uh, which, uh, oh yeah, all of its forms have that all the way down to the wormling. So hang on to that because you can use it in any of the actual forms. Um, we're not going to run through the uh, Callius, Callius, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, but this is the dragon god that they present you with. Uh, so that's cool. You get a full stat block for it. It's a CR 30 monster, just like uh, Tiamat is, except this one is actually a dragon still. And technically, this is just an avatar of it. So in a way, you could think of it, it's actually stronger than the Tiamat that's presented because it is not the entirety of the god's power. So that's super cool. The other thing I really, really want to hit on, because I am seeing that I am talking more than I expected to, uh, is the uh, Aberrant Dragon template that they've got here. This is the monster that they hand you as the artwork and the Aberrant Ancient Red Dragon. That thing is crazy looking, okay? Um, it's got something called a Warp Attack uh, that it can make as... A legendary action uh, again legendary actions legendary resistances that sort of thing um and it is an innate an innate psionic spellcaster which is pretty cool um but the warp attack it opens a rift in space teleporting to an unoccupied space you can see within 40 feet of it each creature within 15 feet of the space the dragon left must succeed on a dc 25 strength saving throw or take 14 force damage and be pulled pulled 15 feet toward the space the dragon left that is so good for creating space uh just between you and the things that are surrounding you to really get down on you this is a cr 26 monster with 546 hit points and an ar armor class of 22 um this also has hover which is cool and actually very specific uh, the rules around fly and hover they don't really lay it out super super like specifically and well in an easy to find place in the books um but creatures with a flying speed can fly but if they suddenly are immobilized for some reason they fall to the ground creatures with a hover in parentheses or after their uh fly speed aren't dropped to the ground when they're immobilized like that so this thing while it has these crazy like tendril wings it doesn't need them it just floats presumably because it's psionic and monstrous and all that crazy stuff um this thing has a maddening presence that goes with it. And by when I say this thing, when I'm talking about any of this stuff, I'm talking about the template that you layer on top of this, uh, of really any dragon as you use it. Uh, you add a maddening presence to it where you can start to drive things away from you. It, they are confused and frightened. Uh, so it's really, really cool. Um, sort, of, sort of an interesting different take on the frightful presence. And the, the breath weapon that they present to you with this is the Deep Fire Breath weapon. Uh, dragon exhales unearthly black fire in a 90-foot cone. Creature in that area must make a DC 24 dexterity save, taking 26 D6 fire damage on a failed save or half as much as successful on a successful one. A creature under the effects of the dragon's maddening presence takes an extra 4 D6 psychic damage. That's so cool. Any sort of synergizing effects is always super cool and a, always a win in my book. Um, and I I could talk for a very long time about this. Uh, I could go through word by word in this thing and talk about it for at least twice as long as it would take me to read you every single word out of this book. Um, I'm not going to. I'm just going to summarize what the subclasses are real quick or just sort of tell you what they are. Uh, the cleric is a balanced domain cleric, uh, which is really cool. Fighter is a Cosmic Knight. Um, both of those are kind of exactly what you would expect. Uh, Ranger is a Dragon's Apprentice, which is kind of Drake Wardeny, but not quite Drake Wardeny. Um, you you don't get a, a buddy necessarily, um, but it, you don't get a buddy early on. You can kind of get a buddy towards the end of the, the whole thing. Uh, and your Sorcerer, you get the Draconic Weave, uh, subclass, which is cool. It's different than the Draconic Bloodline. Um, but it, it has a similar sort of vibe overall. Um, 
this this book is phenomenal. Uh, it, again, was not particularly expensive. I don't remember exactly how much it was. I probably should have looked it up and written down. But I decided when I was thinking about this one that I was just going to kind of fly by the seat of my pants and see what I figured out uh, and decided to say along the way when I was talking about this book because I have read it so much and so many different times. So I am very much glad that you guys got stuck watching me ramble on about this because it is super cool and I super recommend it. Um, I think, I think that that might be it for me. Um, I got to pick up my mug here. Hang on. Uh, yeah, I'm going to say that that is everything I have to talk to you guys about today. So thank you so much for tuning in and making me part of your morning routine. I really do appreciate it. Uh, and thank you so much in particular to my patrons. You guys are the ones that are really making this show possible. If you are able to and want to support the show, the link to that is in the description of this video. Um, we are actually coming up on that goal uh, on Patreon for when I will be able to start pushing this show as a podcast. So if you want to see this show as a podcast, go over there and just see if there is any amount that you would be able to support because every little bit pushes us closer to that goal. And we are actually very close right now. Uh, so thank you guys so much for your support, for your continued support, for your growing support. I appreciate it so very, very much. Um, but as I mentioned before... I believe that that is everything that I have to talk to you guys about today. Uh, so with all that said, I will see you guys tomorrow. And until then, keep on rolling.